got to give it up for DuckTales. We got Purple Bears in the back. You know, we got Hampton. I think it was alma mater. It's good. It's good. It's a good Sunday. Um, I almost have to change the message to like just knowing that God loves you because, you know, Daniqua said applaud yourself. And there was like half of the room did it, half the room didn't. So I'm like, wait, God loves us, right? Like this is just true. You know, it's God rejoices over us with singing. But I think some of y'all were just like, you know, I want to applaud you, Daniqua. So I'll keep going with the topic as uh, uh, as planned. Uh, this is actually our last Sunday in our Behold Kingder, Kingdom Summer series. It's our last Sunday in it. So you've been around for a while. We've been talking about God's kingdom a lot. And because we are a church, we're a church that's looking at Jesus, that's trying to focus on Jesus, we do that all the time anyway. And our particular movement of churches, the vineyard, that's kind of what our, our church is known for, looking after God and God's kingdom. So there's uh, something I wanted to say at the beginning, because when we think about a kingdom, we have to think what kind of trust do we have in it? What kind of reliance do we have on it? Some of you guys have heard this example before, maybe someone sharing about like knowledge or faith or trust where, you know, they get a chair out and they're like, can you trust this chair? You know, or they look out at the crowd and they say like, do you trust? Like, do you know how to have faith? And you're like, wait, what are you talking about? And they're like, see, you're sitting on a chair. Do you think you were going to fall off like last second? No, like that's trust. That's faith. And, like, you might be blown away by that or not. I'm not going to give opinions on, like, that message. If you like it, some of you guys might have taught that, so I don't want to offend you. But one thing I will say is when I think about what faith is, I don't often think faith is just sitting down. Right? Like, that faith is just being seated. You know, in our movement of churches, it says faith is spelled R-I-S-K. It's spelled risk. And so when I think about faith, I think about being active. It's not just being seated. And one of the things that makes, I think, faith hard is that it's not just sitting down. It's not just trusting in a chair, uh, which, by the way, Todd Kennedy will tell you, since he's ordered some of these, they can actually hold 600 pounds. I don't believe that, but it's true, apparently. Maybe that's faith. Maybe that's like another. Someone could take that and just go run with it, right? But I guess it's true. <laughs> not all of them. Some of them. <laughs> okay, just some, some. Some of them that we've ordered. But there's something about this journey of faith, this journey of trust, and trusting in a king or a kingdom, right? Where we need to know, can we depend on it? Can we depend on this king? And for me, as I think about that, again, it's not like it's a one-time thing, just sit down and you're good. But actually, the active life of faith is something like sit down, stand up, walk, go here, go there, rest. No, not just like seated rest, like lay down. We heard that prayer that God makes us lay down in green pastures. Rest is different than just sitting down. There's something about what it means to follow God and to seek after the kingdom that looks active, that looks involved, that makes it tricky. If it was just sitting down, trusting, maybe more of us would have an easier time with it. But that's not been my experience of trying to follow Jesus. It's been active and involved. I think a lot of the things we've been learning this summer as we behold this kingdom is that we need to rely upon God and we need to respond to God. We have this quest for reliance and responsiveness. Rely is this way of trusting in, having faith in, and responding is being active and attentive to God. And so what we've done this summer is we've beheld and we wanted to behold so we could become. And a lot of what we looked at was just thinking about who Jesus is, looking at what he did in his healings, in his teachings, seeing who Jesus is like, and then saying, could we behold that? Not necessarily do it right away. So we see Jesus do a healing work. Okay, now we got to heal someone. Or Jesus says, be the light of the world. We got to do that. We got to say that to someone. To actually wait a second, to pause, and to behold what it means that Jesus is inviting us to that, or Jesus is doing that. But I hope that you've seen the last three weeks, there's been a little bit of a shift in what Jesus has been up to. He hasn't just done things or talked to people. He's actually instructed. He's directed. He's even commanded. So this summer we've beheld and hopefully we've become. But in these last three weeks, we're actually being challenged to do certain things. Do you guys catch that the last three weeks? The, the, we've had three invitations, really. The first three weeks ago was to be sent. This is Jesus sending out the 70 We've been challenged to be sent in weakness and in vulnerability. Then in the story of the Good Samaritan, we were challenged to go and do likewise. Go and do like this Good Samaritan and show mercy. And Patrick even kind of flipped that for us and said, it actually matters for us to be able to receive mercy too. 
from even the wrong kind of person, whoever we would say that is. The Samaritans weren't seen as the, the good folks to Jesus' crowd. And then last week, Matt shared about how we can choose a lifestyle of worship rather than worrying or fretting, even if it's about Jesus, even if it's about religious things, how do we choose the one thing that is worshiping God? So we've been challenged to behold, but in beholding, we're now hearing Jesus give these specific challenges, invitations, be sent out in vulnerability and weakness, go and do likewise and show mercy, choose a lifestyle of one thing, worship. Those are our invitations. It's what Jesus is saying. If we're listening, then go and do it. And the question is, do we rely on God to trust him to do that? Are we responsive to the invitations God will give us? As we wrap up today, we're actually going to go straight into Luke 11. It's the next part of the text. And it's just the first few verses in Luke 11. And it's Jesus actually giving another invitation, another uh, way for us. So we're not just beholding, but we're actually listening, hopefully obeying. And it's about prayer. So before we listen to what Jesus has to say about prayer, let's actually pray together. God, thanks so much for who you are. Thank you uh, that you are God and that you are with us. That You have lessons for us that we can behold you, God, and become more like you. Jesus, I thank you that you have a way for us. And it's this kingdom way. And you want us to track with that and to follow you more than anything. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have a Bible or if you have a phone, you can pull up Luke 11. Uh, there's some Bibles in the back, actually. If you need one, you can go back there uh, where Rev. Raya is. So in Luke 11, we're going to read 1 through 4. And we're actually going to focus on even a smaller part of that text. And this is, again, right after where Matt left off last week. It says this in Luke 11. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. That's John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, who was a spiritual teacher as well. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Someone asked Jesus, how do you pray? And Jesus responds with that answer. I, I love this passage because there's a lot of times where we want to know certain things from Jesus. We, know, we want to know specific things. And we look at the Bible, and it doesn't really say how to do that. <laughs> or it doesn't really include that topic. Here, if we're ever curious about prayer, right, a lot of people around the world pray. Folks that belong to Christianity as a religion, other religions, people of no religion often pray. You've heard it said, you know, as long as there's tests in school, there will be prayer as well, right? Um, there's prayer a lot of places where there's emergency, danger, fretting. There's prayer. And a lot of people around the world, regardless of if they know Jesus, ask, how do we pray? Great thing. Jesus actually tells us how. And it's what we just read. Today we're going to focus on just verse 2. Uh, and I'll read that again for us. When you, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. That's what Luke has. Some other translations of this same gospel, and of course other parts of uh, the gospels, including Matthew, say something a little bit more like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. And so I want to just take this prayer a little bit step by step for us, break it down so we can understand it a bit better, and then try to apply it practically in our lives. W one of the interesting things here is, uh, you know, we're in this series of Behold. There's this invitation, uh, and it's about prayer. It's a formation thing for us, and it seems like it's a prayer we could pray every day. So one of the questions is, if we prayed this prayer every day, what would happen to us? How would we be changed? And some of, uh, some of y'all are like, well, I went to a religious school. Like, I did pray this prayer every day. Like, nothing changed, Josh. Like, or some of you are like, no, it was the most deeply meaningful thing I've ever done. But we have to kind of understand it a little bit more to get the most out of this passage. The first thing I want to say is that this prayer is framed in relationship. It's framed with Father, our Father. 
there's something about that relationship. And this wasn't like unheard of. This wouldn't have been like completely revolutionary. You know, father is in the text in Hebrew scripture talking about God. David, who's this king uh, figure in the Hebrew scripture, uses this. But it is a little bit different for Jesus to popularize that. Hey, everyone, call God father. Call God this loving parent. God frames this prayer in relationship. A father who we can rely on, a father who we can respond to, this heavenly father. Now, there's some amazing things about that because, wow, isn't that relational? Doesn't take it the, the, kind of the sky God who's up here and make it a little bit more practical, a little bit more down to earth. But there's also a problem here. For some of us, when we think about our fathers or mothers or guardians, or people that kind of were the ones taking care of us when we grew up, we don't know how much we would want to rely on that person or respond to that person. Like, it can feel really rich, like, oh, Father, this is great. But for some of you, you're like, nope, it doesn't sound great to me. And even in uh, places and homes that might have had relationships where, oh, this is pretty good, we can still kind of get the wrong opinion about our loving parent, about our mom or our dad, about whoever's taking care of us. I mean, for instance, I grew up in Iowa, and so I lived in a place that had a long gravel road. And if you've ever, like, been around a gravel road, it, it makes noise. Like, it's not smooth, right? Some people are like, yep, I remember. Uh, and what you could tell is you could tell who's coming. Even though you could tell the way they were driving. And so my room was closest to that driveway. And it's pretty long. And so I could hear it. And then as soon as I hear it, I go right to the window to see, like, whose car it is. Because if it was my dad... I would uh, need to kind of get ready for what the house would be like. Like, have I done my homework? Is my book even out? Do I have it done? If it is done, maybe like, have I spent some more time in it? I'm from that kind of nerdy household. Like, is, every, like, is everything done for homework? Yeah, it's been done. I don't need to worry about it. Well, wait, maybe study just 30 more minutes. But why? Uh, uh, okay, let me study for 30 more minutes. So it's not going to just be a problem. There were things I was doing maybe that I wasn't supposed to be doing. My parents really, they were good with technology in some cases, but... Sometimes it was like there was wires with the video game system. So they're like, it's, it's unplugged, right? I'm like, yeah, it's unplugged. Like playing away, right? Like getting on it. So I had to change my behavior, right? Because I heard that car going down the gravel road. I was responding to something. And some of us have cues like that with our authority figures. We have cues about, oh, if they're here, if they look this way, if they say this or don't say this, we know if we can rely and we know how to respond, so when Jesus says father, it really matters what kind of father, right? When we think about a loving parent, it really matters for us to say loving there. Because for some of us, just that one word doesn't do it for us. And even more so when we think about this passage, and don't just think about it as our father, but think about it as Jesus, this king of the kingdom. We have to rely on to bring us this new kingdom of power and love, and this king that invites our responsiveness in real time. Again, when we think of king, Maybe, unfortunately, we think of something like this, like Lion King or character or kingdom or fantasy, right? But it's really just a word for ruler, for authority, for governor, for president. And to think of a king that would be reliable, to think of a king that would be responsive, I mean, do I have to open up the newspaper for you? Either fast forward time, rewind time, current time, don't know all of your political preferences, right? What, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking U.S.? Are you thinking U.K.? Like, I don't know. But all I know is that when we think about king, do you think of yourself as responsive? Do you think of yourself as relying on that person? Jesus invites us to. God is father, heavenly father, a loving parent, different than our own. He's trying to rewire something in us. And then we get this next line, your kingdom come, your will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. And a lot of times in scripture, we get this kind of reference of a heaven and an earth. We're kind of doing a bad thing and doing it up and down. But hey, that's part of how we get this stuff. It's heaven, and it's really saying in contrast with earth, right? Heaven is this mystical place, this heavenly place, this godly place. And then earth is the gritty. It's the real. It's the place where all these things take place, where things get shaped. You know, in heaven, we imagine a new reality where we can 100% rely on the goodness of God, you know, if you've been to maybe a funeral or read this part of scripture, you've heard like, no more crying, no more tears, no more sadness. And we imagine ourselves responding to that kind of world with this delight, this hope, this joy. And yet that's not where we are fully, right? We're here in earth, the land, this rugged place where our lives are being played out. 
And this challenge is kingdom come, will be done on earth, in the land, in the mess, in the grit, as it is in heaven. And that's where we can have some trouble, right? Relying and being responsive. It's not 100% one way. It's a mess. It's mixed up. It's responding to our own grittiness in our lives. And so I have to ask you a couple of questions here before we turn to trying to apply some of this prayer to our lives. And these are two questions that it's gonna, you're going to get, get as much as you, you know, think about these questions. They're kind of are willing to be real. So I'm going to ask them. There's two of them. I'm going to ask them and then I kind of add one thing maybe to help you out a little bit. Two questions. The first is, you know, where do we rely on people or things other than this heavenly father, other than this God, other than King Jesus? Where do we rely on people or things other than God? The second question is, where do we respond to people or things other than God? Now, maybe I can help you out a little bit because you're like, wait, of course I rely on people. Of course I respond to people. Like, duh. Well, maybe it's where do we overly rely on people or things other than God? And where do we overly respond to people or things other than God? If you ever maybe observed people and you kind of see someone, hey, I, I want to go here for dinner. Oh, do you want to go there? Like, with this money? Like, I'm going to give you, you know, they're like, wow, you really were responsive to, like, what they were saying. Or you, you see someone, it almost seems like they're overly depending on them. And you wonder, wh- what kind of shaped that? What kind of worked that in the relationships? Well, the thing is, we oftentimes like to look at others to see that kind of dysfunction. Unfortunately, bad news, we're the same way. <laughs> we do the same thing. It might not be in the same way that other person does, but all of us at times lean and overly rely on other people or other things other than God, even things that might seem really good. And we also are overly attentive or responsive, right? Again, remember that example I was using with like a father or mother or someone that kind of comes into the room. How many times do one of your parents come into the room and they had a certain face or they said a certain thing and you responded like that? Oh, they're already disappointed in me. I need to then do something. That's you responding and being overly attentive to a way that they are. These two questions really matter because this prayer is a prayer formation. It's a prayer that we can behold God's kingdom coming. And I just want to, as in our remaining time, think about it, how that kingdom comes in three different places. This would be kind of like me breaking down the earth. Because if I just say it's this land, yeah, we can get that. And we can definitely think of ways that God's kingdom could come to the land But I want to just explore it in three different ways, give you some examples, ask you some questions, and then head on to communion. The three different places are how God's kingdom can come in our hearts as it is in heaven, in our relationships as they are in heaven, and in the place where we live, the place where we are as it is in heaven. When I think about those three categories of heart, relationships, and place, um, it's hard sometimes for me to see presently kind of how I'm doing with God, right? Like, have you ever just felt like, oh, how am I doing with God? How am I relating to God? And when you think about, like, the current time, it's sometimes unclear. You don't know. It's kind of staticky. But then if you think, well, what about 15 years ago? You're like, oh, God, (laughs) I I know. I kind of know what I was doing or what I was struggling with or how this was going. For me, I've been thinking a lot lately of Josh at 18 years old when I was invited to go to this place, Yale, and I could think about those different things. How is my heart? How are my relationships? What did I care about the kingdom coming in the place where I was? And I have very clear answers for you, like very clear, because it's a striking time of my life. And thankfully, I think I've grown a little bit since then. So maybe for you, you might have trouble accessing this right now. But if you think, what about five or 10 or 15 years ago? You would know, hey, how was my heart, my relationships, this place doing? Was I responding to people or things other than God? How was I doing that? Was I relying on people or other things in God? So I just want to share a little story for you uh, about 18-year-old Josh. He maybe would have worn things more like this. I don't know. I have to look at my wardrobe. Hopefully not. Um, But in my heart, right, uh, I was very overly attentive, right, overly sensitive to what this place was going to tell me about myself, what Yale would say about me. Now, I was 18. I just came from Iowa, like I said. I've been bullied for 12 years. 
And this was a place where I was like, I'm finally going to like blossom and make it and get out. And it's going to be amazing or, or not. <laughs> but this is my one chance. This is my chance to get it, right? And my heart was so attentive to what it would mean to form something that I would absolutely love, that I could adore, a place that could be home for me. And I put so much pressure on myself and I actually responded so much to Yale in terms of, it, could, could Yale do that? Now, some of us have had uh, this kind of uh, history with a college or a place or a town. It's like, this place is going to make me, right? And as soon as we say that, we're kind of relying on that place. We're dependent on that. Whether it's your new job, whether it's college, this new opportunity. And that's what I did. And I was like, this place is going to make me. And I kind of fell into a trap of wanting that so much and being desperate for that. It affected my relationships because I wasn't thinking about what kind of relationships I was making. I was just so happy to have them. <laughs> I was like, yes, this is great. Like, new connections, right? But I didn't think about the character of the connections. I actually would have called myself a Christian then, but I wasn't thinking about how these relationships are growing me or challenging me or connecting me to things that are important. I was just so happy to have them, right? So happy to be accepted in this way. And then in terms of place, you know, I was placed in New Haven, but I wasn't thinking about our city. You know, Daniqua asked us to give a round of applause for ourselves. Maybe some of the reasons why some of us didn't is we have a complicated relationship with the city. We know that we're here, but we're wondering, are we giving back? Are we serving? That first year, I don't think I did much of that because I wasn't really focused on how the kingdom could come. I was overly responsive to other things, overly relying on other people. But as God challenged me in my faith, I grew. And I thought more about, well, what if Jesus shaped my heart more? What if I gave my heart over to God and started to trust in God a little bit more? Because what if God was trustworthy, this heavenly father, this King Jesus? And I saw how there were times where Yale or my relationships let me down, actually time and time again, where there was this God that said that I could trust in him, a God that I could depend on, could rely on. And what happened was it wasn't like it changed overnight, but I basically started to try. That's a really important word in faith, right? Try. Because what I did was I said, let me take an invitation. There's language in scripture that says, come and see or taste and eat. And I said, well, let me just try. Let me try this Bible study. Let me try this church. Let me see if something changes. And I saw time and time again that there was some positive change. And all of a sudden, my heart started to change. My relationship started to change. Even my relationship with the place that I was in changed. I cared more about this city because something was happening. I was seeing God's kingdom come, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And so really the question is right now today for you, what does earth look like? Because <laughs> it's a big word that I think we could just be like, it's everything. But what's that nitty gritty for your life where you actually need to see God's kingdom more than maybe anything else? Is it in your workplace? Is it in your relationships? Is it kind of like the inner reality of your heart, kind of like how you see yourself? Maybe it is a relationship to a place. But there's something about uh, being invested in that part of who we are so we could track, are we growing or are we not? When Jesus uh, answers, how do you pray, do you notice he doesn't really give us this clear kind of like, yeah, it's just this, and then you're done. He gives us a practice of formation, something we could do day in, and day out, something he could do in the morning or in the evening. And even though there's things that he could do, right, God could just bring his kingdom now, or God could bring forgiveness now, or God could end temptation, or sometimes there's a line, deliver us from evil now, but he invites us to pray for those things. And I wonder if it's because he wants our hearts to change, our relationships to change, the way we care about place to change. And he knows that prayer does that work. As we wrap up, I want to invite you to think about, again, those three places one more time. Where is Jesus moving in your heart and challenging you to rely and to respond to God more than anything else? And think realistically, where is that something else in your life? Again, is it maybe friends or your job or what people think of you? What about relationships? Would you say that your relationships are characterized by seeking God's kingdom? in the ways we've talked about all summer? Or do you kind of just think they're just there? You know, we joked about, like, just saying kingdom before things, like kingdom relationships, kingdom Doritos, kingdom T-shirts, right? No, that's not how it works. It's like, 
Are your relationships characterized by this King Jesus of the kingdom? We know a little bit more of what he's like now at the end of the summer than the beginning. He's merciful. He's kind. He's forgiving. He loves outsiders. Are your relationships marked by that kind of king? And also in the place that you're in, are you asking God's kingdom to come? Do we ask for God's kingdom to come in this city? In the places where we work, where we play, where we've seen this summer people get shot and killed? Are we asking God's kingdom to come there? Because you see that Jesus doesn't say you have to have a solution for that today. He says pray about it today. Because in prayer we change. In prayer we're transformed. We become different kinds of people. The people God needs in this world to bring about his kingdom. So in heart, in relationships, and in place, think about how you can invite God's kingdom to come. We want to pray for us and pray expectantly because that's what God's taught us to do. I just want to pray the Lord's Prayer over us. I'm going to do a little bit slowly, maybe give a, uh, a few more ways I think God's speaking in this time. And then I'll invite the worship team to come up. So I'm going to read that passage one more time for us. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say this. And today we pray, Father, hallowed be your name. God, we choose today to call you our Father, our loving parent. And we choose to relate to you as a good authority that we would be responsive to, that we could rely on. And God, where we act like you're someone you're not, like an angry parent or like a boss or a taskmaster, we ask for your help to see you rightly, to see you truly. God, we say your name is holy and precious. And we ask for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now that we would know a little bit more about what your kingdom is and how, God, you are bringing it to earth right now. And to earth means not just to this like kind of planet, but to our mess, to the gritty things of our lives, the things that don't seem heavenly, the things that don't seem perfect, the things that seem uh, out of order. So God, would you help each person here identify what that is and bring your kingdom there? God, would you give us each day our daily bread? Would you give us provision so we can keep praying in this costly way? Would you take care of our needs so we can live a costly life, so we can serve in a costly way? We pray that the things that you uh, are, are giving to us, we would receive with thanks. And the things that we need, we would confess and say them to you so we wouldn't give excuses saying, well, I can't pray your kingdom to come or see your kingdom come because I don't have those things. But we'd say, Lord, would you just provide for us so we can live a kingdom life, so we can pray in this costly way. And God, would you forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone is indebted, who is indebted to us so we can live freely, we can live with newness. We can live with a sense of cleanness that when we do wrong, we're asking for forgiveness. And when others wrong us, we're saying uh, we're sorry. We're, we're, we're giving this kind of freedom. And God, would you lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil? Thank you, Jesus, that you're over those things, and yet you invite us to relate to you around them so we don't get discouraged, so we don't get knocked out of the race. But instead, we say, through you, we will keep persevering. Through you, we will keep going forward. God, thank you that you truly are the king of the kingdom. And that means that we can look to you, that we can run hard after you, that we can seek you first. And thank you that in your word it says that your kingdom is at hand. It's not fully here, and yet it's not just for later. But there's a kind of mess right now. And you invite us to be present in it, to rely on you and to respond to you more than anything else. Help us do that in Jesus' name. I want to invite the worship team to come up. We celebrate communion every week because we're acknowledging that in the mess of our lives, and if you don't have communion elements, you can raise your hand, and we'll have some staff people come. So raise your hand and just keep it up until uh, someone gets it to you. Uh, but we celebrate communion every week because we're acknowledging in the mess of everything, 
Jesus brings forth his kingdom in such an unusual way, in such a way that uh, is surprising, that he dies on a cross for us, for our sake, all for love. We see that Jesus brings this kingdom to bear through his life, his very life. And we see in the garden he's praying about his heart. We see that he's trying to impact his relationships to have people help and serve even along the way. And we know that through what he's done, the place that we're in actually changes because we have connection to God in a whole new way. I want you to take the elements. I want you to take out the bread, which is the body of Christ broken for us. I want you to take and eat it. This is Jesus' body broken for you. I want you to open up the cup, the blood of Jesus. I want you to drink from it. This is the blood of Jesus shed for you. Through these elements, we are made whole, we are healed, we enter into newness, newness of life. And we, God, uh, can yeah, become one with you. Help us do that. Help us rely on you and respond to you in everything. In Jesus' name, amen.